hello everybody and welcome to our webinar for this evening. Um, this is our sixth uh, professional development webinar series for the extended lockdown um, uh, series that we've uh, put together. So we're very excited tonight to introduce another guest speaker. This is our third guest speaker. Um, so we have with us tonight Dr. Benita Sharma. Um, Vanita is going to be talking about um, Ayurvedic medicine, which is, you know, a 5,000 year old uh, system of medicine, um, traditional Indian medicine. And uh, Dr. Sharma is a fifth generation um, integrative or Indian integrative um, Ayurvedic doctor. So she has a fair bit to share. She also runs a successful clinic in uh, Melbourne called Vibe. Uh, vibe, a, vibe A Vader, I think that's what it's called. Is that right, Benita? And um, yeah, so she's going to be doing a presentation. So we're very excited to hear from Benita. I'm going to hand over to Benita to start um, with tonight's webinar. Thank you. Namaste, everyone. Um, am I audible to everyone? Okay, good. Um, well, um, Gary has already introduced myself. Like, uh, uh, I just wanted to um, just say a little bit about my practice, like because I'm uh, I'm practicing uh, currently in Melbourne, in Australia, uh, for the last twenty two years, and and I had been um, like uh, practicing Ayurveda, but um with with it like mainly the panchakarma therapies which i'm going to talk about when when we're going to discuss about what ayurveda entails and and what it is what it is all about like so um we'll just um, go with the slides and then i'm happy to take the questions like in the last like so if you have any queries um and uh, um the perspective like uh, it's it's much needed um especially with the with the unprecedented times that we are all going through um uh, globally at the moment with the with the covid and um, um ayurveda is such a thing that um it's a science that we can practice at home uh, along with uh, not only uh, just as a practitioner, but every kitchen I say has uh, Ayurveda in their home. Uh, so it could be, it doesn't have to be Ayurvedic herbs. Um, there are all sort of like herbs, which are um, Chinese, some of the Chinese herbs, um, are there which are ayurvedic herbs as well and then there are um, indigenous australian herbs which are even used um, as the herbs in um, in ayurveda so uh, bringing uh, across the whole um, ayurveda perspective so this is um vast institute is under nk institute like so um i'm working along with um uh, our um hugo uh, and and uh, um i'm just like uh, going to start sharing the slides and talk by it one by one so just introducing our ancient science, Ayurveda today. Um, I was looking forward, first of all, like uh, uh, to get Ayurveda being introduced to every one of you. And uh, I know a lot of you were looking forward for this. Um, it's, it's like the oldest system or the science uh, which is being practiced in India as a mainstream medicine um even above uh, the complementary uh, like in the complementary stream under the ayush health ministry ayush is um indian health ministry which is which uh, full form is ayurveda yoga unani siddha and homeopathy so it's the department that actually um considers ayurveda uh, as the integrated 
uh, Ayurvedic medicine that's integrated with the mainstream conventional medicine and is practiced throughout India. Uh, even in the hospitals, they have like a department for Ayurveda, which is uh, separately um, run across um, in the hospitals. And uh, Ayu means life. And Veda means a classical text. So it's the science that originated uh, from the classical text or a science of life, uh, we call it. That's why it's called Ayurveda. And it's a 5,000 years old science which actually evolved um, 5,000 years ago. And uh, as we are all aware that conventional medicine is only uh, 250 to 400 years roughly um, uh, like old and Ayurveda was um, practiced even before it was um, came into existence like as, as a pathy or a science or a medicine. So um, we call it as a empirical medicine, which is, um, which involves like an organoleptic uh, part of like, bit of like the spirituality and religion because um, like religiously we have kind of like a four Vedas. So it's considered as the fifth way that which was meant for the well-being for the humanity and the mankind and and for for the mankind to help like if because we considered as as um if there is a body uh then obviously we have an illness and and if there is an illness in the body even the healing is within the body so ayurveda as a whole addresses the root cause of the of the issues like it doesn't just like address um uh, symptoms and and uh, taken as as a banded approach so we eradicate and try to eradicate the root cause of the problem addressing the symptoms along with with the um the main uh, root cause of the problem or the issue uh, so in in ayurveda the health is considered as as a um, not just a possibility that that um, you might achieve it is a reality and and an underlying a uh, natural state of being so the health will manifest once you begin uh, to live in alignment with nature's intelligence so when we talk about um, Ayurveda, so this is the health approach that we take um, in Ayurveda, which is uh, in Sanskrit, it's called, I'll, I'll translate that uh, to make you understand, but it's a Samadosha, Samadhatu, Samagnishya Malakriya, Prasanna Atma Indriya Mana, which is um, we say like the health overall health is basically when everything all the uh, doshas all the uh, tissues or the humors uh, body humors or the tissues and when the digestive fire or the gut health everything is in a balanced form and which actually gives a harmony to your mind body and your spirit which brings happiness and harmony by having that balance in the body is considered as health so talking about like a, a main like it it uh, ayurveda proposes two methodologies, that's objectives of Ayurveda. So uh, towards approaching the health. So the first one, uh, we take it as a preventative and, and a promotive. And the second one we take is restorative, um, which is 
स्वास्थ्य स्वास्थ्य रक्षण एंड सेकेंड वन इज रिस्टोरेटिव इज आतुर विकार प्रशमन विच मीन्स दैट we the the main objective of ayurveda is not only to treat the conditions but to prevent and act as a preventative and promotive uh, medicine so which actually prevents any kind of like illness uh in the first place and then restorative which means like we uh take the uh support with the help of ayurvedic herbs uh and we fix like um with the with the treatments such as panchakarma treatments and and we even do the um take the support of the herbs like to treat any kind of like condition but to prevent we adapt some diet and the lifestyle changes to protect and promote the well being and the health to basically uh, promote the longevity of life and then treat the condition if needed after we take that approach after if we think that yes we couldn't prevent and if some illness has taken place we adapt the path of like um instructing like some kind of like body therapies that entails uh, uh the panchakarma is basically panch means five karma means actions so we adapt those as a mode of treatment and we help by doing those therapies to eradicate the root cause of the problem so that's the restorative approach and and we prevent it by following specific type of like diet and eating habits and lifestyle and everything uh so to support like um in not getting ill at a first place so ayurveda is dr sharma excuse yeah. me dr sharma can i interrupt are you able to share yeah. your slides cuz we can't see them your powerpoint Oh okay sorry just That's a second. That's all right. We just want to see your fantastic slides. <laughs> yeah sure. Just a second. Can you see Perfect. it now? Perfect. Okay. Thank sorry. you. Sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so no, that's okay. Keep going. I, I just like I uh, had um uh in mind that i'm actually sharing it uh so sorry okay and um so yeah so that's me and i haven't spoken much in the slides yet like so you can certainly uh look at that um so these were the two methodologies that i mentioned about preventative and promotive and restorative approach that i was just like uh, referring to just now um and uh okay so uh ayurvedic approach uh, to the lifestyle so health uh in ayurveda is greatly influenced by the lifestyle uh and the diet like diet factor is very very important uh and lifestyle is called swastha vritta vritta means like um uh like lifestyle and and swast means like to have a good health and good health uh, by uh, adapting the lifestyle changes and the diet changes so we um adapt like a the approach of following the daily regime and then the night regime as well as the seasonal regime so these three approaches basically um entails um how we follow the uh traditions like and and to assist in any kind of like conditions or to prevent any kind a kind of illness 
we follow and we take the approach by following these lifestyle changes. So then when we talk about Dincharya, uh, which is like the daily, I will be talking in detail afterwards, like what does that entails? But um, that's Din means day and Charya means uh, the regime that we follow during the daytime. And then we follow a different regime at the nighttime and then Ayurveda takes seasonal changes into consideration quite a lot. And um, especially between the change of or the transition of the seasons, um, it's very, very important um, for uh, adapting the lifestyle changes. Uh, we need to follow the day routine, night routine, but the season matters a lot. And the seasonal changes or whatever we adapt, um, like a different eating, different foods that we eat in different seasons and according eating according to the seasons is very, very important because it's um, Ayurveda, in Ayurveda we believe like the matter is made up of five elements similar way our body is made up of five elements so out of five we mainly focus on the three which is the three humors or um we say the three um like the life forces and when we talk about these three pillars of health we mention diet sex and sleep which is Ahar Vihar Nidra. So if we say there is a balance in these three main pillars of health and three main factors, if your diet is balanced, if your sexual life is good, if uh, your sleep and uh, sleeping pattern or your uh, sleep is good, you wouldn't have any kind of like imbalances in the body. So, so to define basically Ayurveda is what I was making you understand about all these like three humors, as long as it's all about creating a balance in these three humors, which is uh, the Vata, Pitta, Kapha, so Ayurveda is all based on these three humors um, and, and the Panch Mahabhutas from where these three um, humors actually evolved. So when we talk about um, these, like um, the fundamental principles of Ayurveda, uh, that's the main basis and the foundation of Ayurveda. So we need to follow all this and create the balance with the help of like diet and adapting some lifestyle changes and, and uh, um, with the means of like a yoga, meditation, uh, that's actually a sister science of Ayurveda and yoga has been practiced globally uh, for ages. And uh, yoga is the means of, um, fixing your lifestyle but um, Ayurveda fixes you your conditions and and your daily regimes and fixes your lifestyle as well by incorporating yoga and meditation uh, in any form so when we talk about these fundamental principles of Ayurveda uh, we talk about Sankhya um, which is um, the Sankhya philosophy. I will go one by one afterwards. Uh, I'll just name the few, the five primordial elements, Pancha Mahabhuta. Pancha means five, Mahabhuta means the primordial elements. So they are air, fire, water, ether, earth, or ether or space. Uh, and out of like these five, we mainly choose these three humors that, that I indicated about um, uh, the doshas. So when we, um, 
uh, when we choose like uh, the the three humans when we're talking about doshas like the doshas basically are called doshas when when these three humans are basically in an imbalanced state so the balanced state is the good health and and it's all about creating a balance in these imbalanced constituents of the body or the uh, main they are considered as a spine in the body or the three humors you can say or the constituents or life forces or energy forces because everything in ayurveda is based on on these three vata pitta and kapha so vata is the air pitta is the fire kapha is the water and then these three elements basically constitute another two two of the each of these pancha mahabhutas the elements the primordial elements um so when we balance these three the other two gets balanced by itself and even when we are addressing any kind of like condition in in ayurveda uh we basically take these three elements like to create a balance in these uh, three with the help of like support of diet and lifestyle and eating habits um and then we take the approach of like herbs and the treatments or the body treatments if we need to so then we talk about the another fundamental um a principle is the seven tissues dhatu then there are 16 channels srotas uh then what's the approach in ayurveda for anatomy and what does the digestive fire or the agni means in ayurveda then what are the toxins or the ama like what they call in the modern terminology as the bacteria or the toxins um that's called ama in ayurveda the ayurvedic mind which is the manas manas means the brain prakriti means the nature nature of the brain what does it take like what approach the brain takes and and we take in ayurveda the approach to address any kind of um mental illnesses or anything to address in the nervous system so then ritu charya ritu means season and the routines that we follow in each season then there is a rog karan which is the etiology of the disease um and what's what's the cause of the disease so as i mentioned before like we address the root cause of the problem and then there is a pathogenesis so pathology or samprapti which is what uh, pathogenesis or what patho- pathological approach we take to address any kind of like conditions so um so sankhya the first fundamental principle so it's basically when we talk about sankhya sankhya is enumeration or the evolution of consciousness into the material nature so that entails set of 24 main principles or the tatvas uh to evolve into the material nature so this picture like basically demonstrates the sankhya the enumeration what do we call is first we take like as a purusha purusha is the all pervading consciousness or the witness which is the matter and then there is a prakriti which is manifest nature and there is a creative expression so when we take the two the main principle that it works on is the matter and the nature so there is a macrocosm 
there is a microcosm. So the Purusha is the individual. That's, that's actually the main conscious self or the conscious body. And then the Prakriti, which is the macrocosm, is the Prakriti, the nature of the body. So in Ayurveda, we go in tune with the body and the nature. And we cry, try to create a balance in the imbalanced constituents by addressing the main, it's very individual centric. So we, we address each individual's conditions rather than taking a generic approach for the overall condition. We take an integrated approach uh, to analyze or assess the condition of the purusha, the individual, which is, uh, we are talking about um, microcosm. And Prakriti, the nature, which is a micro, macrocosm, will basically address um, the Mahat, which is the universal intelligence, and then buddhi, which is the intellect or the brain, individual discriminative intelligence. Then we get on to the individual ego consciousness, and we divide that through further into the three gunas, which is sattva, rajas, and tamas. So these are the three gunas. When we talk about three gunas, gunas means when we talk about the quality and, and the nature of the, of the body or the person or the individual. So when we talk about sattva, we talk about diet. We talk about uh, sattvic diet, which is the pure. Sattva means the purity. And, and then there is a rajas. Rajas is, is the combination, kind of a uh, little bit of sattva. And then uh, there is a little bit of uh, rajas is basically to help you with your... Um, it's the combination of sattva and rajas, like a dual nature person which is uh, out of the three constituents when we talk about vata, pitta, kapha, we take each of the individual could be uh, one, one constituent in dominance, but he may be a dual natured. So he, an individual uh, can be a combination of vata, pitta, pitta, kapha, kapha, vata, or vata, kapha, or pitta kapha, so anything two. It could be a combination of two, or it could be just like one by itself. So in today's time, like in the modern times, uh, most of the people are on Radzik diets, which is a lot of people are, are kind of, not purely vegetarian, they could be a mixture, they, they eat veggies, but they eat meat as well. But then that's like a, a pita food, which is kind of um, makes you adaptable to today's world. So most of the individuals are Rajas that fall under the Rajas category. Sattva is very pure, like just on the on the fruits, vegetables, um, doing fastings, and and sattvic is um, basically a lighter food or meals to digest that you eat. Those people they say, oh, we eat very sattvic, uh, which is lighter to digest good metabolism, good digestion, assimilation. And, and when we talk about the sattva, um, sattva comes 
it covers the jananindriya, which is the organs of knowledge. Say we perceive the sound with the ears, all the senses, the skin perceives the touch, eyes, they see the light, tongue carries the taste, nose that observes the smell. So all of the sense organs, they are called the organs of knowledge because they all have one particular trait in them and it's single trait. So you can't hear with the nose or you can't smell with your ears. So it's like one individual trait, a person who has like one single constitution in dominance that comes under sattva. And most of the people, when you, when you relate to organs of, of action, then mouth is responsible for speech. Hands are instruments of grasping. Feet allow by walking motion. Reproductive organs for procreation. And anus allows for elimination of the bowels, like and all that kind of stuff. So manas, the brain is a knowledge and action, both. So the jananindri is what you are born with, like with one particular um, organ, the sense organs carries one single trait. Then the organs of action, that we do that we do it with the what we do it with the mouth or the hands we can't reverse that like you can't do what you do with the hands you can do with the feet so they are called like organs of action so the minus the brain lies in the middle which is the carrier of the knowledge and the action so the brain perceives everything like through the senses your brain basically perceives the taste the sounds the actions the lights the taste and the smell and then that knowledge is transmitted in the form of what you think with your brain you act and you bring that into evolution so that's overall the sattva so Rajas, as I said, a lot of people or the individuals these days, uh, they use both aspects of, of knowledge and action. And, and they, they carry all these individual ego consciousness and they, they have a brain, buddhi, intellect and mark which is the universal intelligence that they adapt and that actually creates the evolution of conscious and the subconscious self which is the nature what you adapt or inherit from your um, uh, through like genetically uh, or hereditary uh, you adapt it from your grandparents or your uh, parents, that's your prakriti, your nature, that you manifest um, naturally through the birth. And the tamas is basically the, the seed element. Uh, so the sound and and the greater element in the sound is the is the guna of space so touch is the guna of air form is the guna of fire taste is the guna of water and smell is the guna of earth so out of those five primordial elements, each of the senses, the sound, the touch, the form, the taste, the smell, they have one 
individual constituent information. And, and they have the guna, which is the quality, the quality of the space. And touch in the similar way has a quality of the air. So to give an example, uh, the touch, you feel the air is warm and cold when, when the air flowing outside, when it comes in touch with your skin, you feel the, whether the air is hot or it's cold. So the air has the quality of the touch because unless it touches your skin, you wouldn't be able to tell whether it's, it's hot or it's cold. So you need to feel that, that touch to be able to find out what trait it carries. So similar way, when we talk about the smell, we smell it, we taste it, and we form, we touch, and we hear the sound. So all these like are the seed elements in tamas, which is, uh, they're called tanmitras, like which are the friends of the skin. And, and when we feel everything, the sound with the ears, and because there is a space in there, so it has the quality of the space. And the touch, as I gave you the example, it has the air constituent. And form has a fire. So unless like you, the fire takes its form, like in the sense when um, it shapes the vision. Say for example, we can look, or we can uh, hear or whatever if if somebody is talking we can hear it through the ears and the place for the vision is the eyes and it's a position for the light or the fire so anything that's relative uh, because we, we basically um, give all these three humans the position in the body. So which I will show you in the other picture. So when we talk about the, this as a Purusha and the Prakriti, how they are interrelated and, and how the individual forms up the nature, the Prakriti is the nature. And Vikruti is the imbalance. Prakriti is the balance. What you're born with or what you inherited genetically from your parents or grandparents, that becomes your Prakriti or the constituent, the actual constituent of the body. And then there is a Vikruti that you self-manifest because of your imbalances uh, caused due to your eating habits and your lifestyle. So we call it as a Brahm, the whole uh, globe or the consciousness that evolved, uh, which is Sankhya, the enumeration, is formed up with the combination of the individual and its nature. So that's why I mentioned when we go in tune with the body and the nature and the matter, is made up of five elements. So when the matter is made up of five elements, similar way, a body is made up of five elements. So that's why it's the consciousness that creates the Prakriti and, and it's the individual is in the, in the passive form and the Prakriti, which is microcosm, is in the active form. So the Purusha individual is within, which is the mind, body, and the soul we consider. Outwards is the external nature 
or the environment that's that's where we are like in the prakriti we are always surrounded by the nature and we are part of the nature and that's where we evolved from so it's the sankhya is all about how we evolved from nature and why there was a consciousness and then there was a subtle level and then there was a, a main uh, prakriti that evolved or the nature uh, we developed because of our inheritance that we adapted from our ancestors or uh, grandparents. So then we talk about singular or diverse. So obviously nature is very diverse and, and the individual is a single. So we take very individualized approach in Ayurveda on the basis of evolving that consciousness. So it's, it's formless. It's just a, a creation that doesn't have any form. So the individual is formed by all these, their nature that they develop or the constitution that they uh, develop because of getting that inherited from their parents, but then they create this imbalance in the body, which is, created because of the self-eating habits and, and the lifestyle. And then we talk about these Panch Mahabhutas, which is the five primordial elements and the seeds of doshas. So we call them doshas, all these three humans, Vata, Pitta, Kapha, when they are in an imbalanced state. And we call them Gunas, although sattva, rajas and tamas is the quality of the body, whether they are sattvic, they are rajasic or tamasic. So uh, it even, I will show you, it will make you more clear like this. Okay. So when we give them the position in the body, the vata's position is in the large intestine, the colon, which is here. So that's all the organs lying below your belly button or um, uh, from kidneys to, to the small intestine, to the large intestine. Uh, small intestines come under pitta. I'll explain you how. But this is the vata, the blue one that you're noticing. Uh, the large colon is a position for water, the air. And Pitta's position is in the small intestines, um, which is the yellow ones we are looking at. And this is the air, the blue, and fire, the yellow. And then we go on to this purple, bluey kind of like thing, uh, all the lungs and and the trachea or uh, the respiratory tract that until the throat or the neck you can say that all comes under kapha so anything viscid or sticky or heavy uh, in the body say the bone marrow in the bones comes under kapha so anybody who is um, like a big structure, like myself, maybe. Um, uh, so the people who are tall and and big, big structure, like a broader frame, body frame, and and heavy. Um, you can even call like the obese people or something like that. Yeah. So uh, they all come under kapha constitution. So anything heavy, like which is a combination of earth and the water, because the water always stay on the ground, on the earth. So it's like anything that's grounded or heavy, solid in the body. That's why I gave the example of bone marrow within the bones is the kapha. Peter? the fire, any digestion, metabolism, assimilation that happens in the body or 
all the organs like liver or gallbladder, small intestines, anything in the middle, just above the belly button and, and the trachea, like the rib cage. Um, all the organs, they're called as pitta organs. And all below the belly button are vata organs, which are the air. So air um, is below the belly button. Middle part is the pitta, the fire, Pit, pit means like a bile, bile or, or the fire. And that's why it's called like the digestive fire. So which I will again explain after. Then kapha, any respiratory organs until your throat or the neck that comes under kapha organs or kapha disorders. Like, so if the problem is within, in your chest, area or anywhere like say asthma uh, anything to do with respiratory diseases or like um, uh, say for example uh, we say bronchitis or uh, tuberculosis or um, anything asthma um, anything to do with the respiratory system that would come under kapha disorders so these are like kapha disorders, then there are pitta disorders, then there are vata disorders. So then you just like, uh, as it's displaying in the diagram, uh, that's the kapha, the pitta, the vata, and then vata is the combination of air and ether. That's why we focus on balancing these three elements, um, the three humans, which is the vata, pitta, kapha, to balance the other two, which is the, um, uh, apart from air, fire, water, like the ether, uh, the space and the water. So that gets balanced naturally by itself when we are balancing these three. And we create that balance with the support of diet, as I said, or by following adapting the herbs and, and the treatments, the body therapies to fix the conditions. Um, or by adapting these lifestyle changes. So then we talk about, I already explained the imbalance is the three dosha, like the tri dosha, tri three, uh, three doshas. Uh, when they are doshas, that's the imbalance. And the balance is when they are all, uh, the, they are called trigunas. Uh, and it's, we are again talking about the air, fire, water, the vata, pitta, kapha. So when they are in a balanced state, they are called trigunas. When they are in an imbalanced state, it's the uh, tridoshas. So um, we call them tree because there are three of these. Uh, tri, like as the three humans. And, and these are three constituents, the main constituents of the body or the three vital forces or the three humors, three energetic forces, because the life in Ayurveda is, it exists or it evolves from these three humors in the body. So now this is, this is the representation um, of what's the Vata body type. And then there is a Pitta body type. So, uh, the blue line shows from where till where whichever organs come under that uh, area, uh, those people are kapha type people. Then pitta is the middle part here. Yeah? And, and then, as I said, like each of the individual, it could be a dual nature. It could be one particular individual could be one. There is very rare that you will find somebody with one body type, like say only Vata or only Pitta or only Kapha. So that's actually considered the perfect or the most healthiest or the Sattvic kind of um, body type. But when we talk about uh, Radzik, then it's, it comes, that's why I mentioned before that we, most of the individuals these days are Radzik because they, they eat combination of meals and then their body type, they can be Vata, Pitta, Pitta, Kapha, like a dual nature. Uh, and Vata, like air. So air 
you can any kind of like movements that happens or the motion that happens in the body that happens like even if i'm giving these gestures with my hands or my lips are moving uh while i'm talking or my tongue i'm using so uh or i'm shaking my neck it happens because of the air element in the body so uh, anything to do with the movement say when you get a headache or you get any kind of like pain because it moves from organ to organ or like when you have a headache like you say yes you've got a headache but the other person wouldn't know unless you tell that person that you have a headache so that's like the air air element in dominance in the body and that what is the imbalance too so uh, it moves because of the air but then there is an imbalance so which means that particular element is aggravated or in dominance in the body at that stage so that's what is causing you a headache so migraines joint aches and pains um bloatings like wherever you see the movement because in the bloating you feel like a gastro um uh, when you eliminate the bowels like and all that kind of like stuff um that elimination happens because of the air element in the body so uh pitta any kind of as i said digestion assimilation or the digestion uh, uh, when we talk about um, any kind of like, uh, you know, the food gets digested because all the metabolism and everything is to do with the liver and the gallbladder and, and all that, like, because there is a bile secreted and the bile is a form of pitta, the fire, uh, and, and any kind uh, of, uh, with the individuals uh, who is skinny, like, they're considered as vata people so uh who have a very single frame like and and very lean and skinny and physique like you know uh as it says thin body irregular shape knobbly knees curly hair tall thin fingers pale complexion and cropped teeth is uh, are the kind of like types of vata type people so it's similar thing for pitta it's athletic body balanced regular body shape straight hair not too thin or lean or skinny and not even um on the other side so not even to uh obeys or whatever prominent eyes ruddy complexion so these are all the pitta signs and kapha like the big bones um solid stocky body overweight big ears large eyes lips big teeth uh, short stubby fingers thick wavy hair thick skin thick nails so all these like um, uh, there is a specific signs and traits with which we even judge the constitution or the body type of the individual because everything from your diet to your treatments um, and your analysis for the condition it's all based on their body type uh, so the body type like it's like a blood type how you look at the blood type so when you look at the body so similar thing we we adapt like with all these and we go um we do to analyze um the constitution the best way or what's the main um like a analysis is done in ayurveda is through nadi pariksha Nadi Pariksha Nadi is the nerve and Pariksha is the examination. So you look at the pulse, not to judge how many heartbeats or what's going on. Uh, it's basically to understand what um, body type you are. So with the pulse, judge the body type of the person and you can judge the prakriti which is the nature that was inherited and then there is a vikruti which is the imbalanced self manifested so that you all can uh, judge with the pulse so here even the pulse you look again at vata pitta kapha 
So the root of the thumb here is the vata. So the root of the thumb is vata, then there is pitta, then there is kapha. So you go away to go vata, pitta, kapha. So you judge like a, and you feel the pulse. Then there is a superficial pulse and there is a deep setted pulse. And then the movement of the pulse, whether it's, it's crippling uh, or slithering like a snake, or it's um, hopping like a frog uh, or like a duck. Uh, so mostly like the water pulse, like if, it's, if you feel the pulse is like, it's like slithering, then it's a water pulse and the water type. And the pitta type, if somebody you feel the pulse and you feel like it's hopping like a frog, thus it's pitta. And then there is kapha, similar thing, like the duck. So everyone, um, as I said, like it could be a dual nature, but it all happens. Um, this is the most difficult part in, in Ayurveda, uh, the pulse. Nadi Pariksha, the pulse analysis, because by doing this, you basically, um, you achieve this by the experience and with the practice. So more people you observe and you look at the variation in the pulse, like then you get to understand what I was talking was like, that makes sense, whether it's a water type, with a type or kapha type. So um, you need to have a lot of like experience uh, and expertise, like basically by, by seeing. So you start with your family first, like, and, and your closer ones, you start checking the pulse to start experiencing, oh, what, what type you are, or um, then what's the imbalance? So we try to bring the, you from that imbalanced state to a balanced state um, by putting uh, on the specific diet that is uh, vata, pitta, or kapha pacifying diet, uh, or create that balance by uh, integrating uh, yoga and meditation, so even with the conditions, the yoga can, um, like a, it can be of a different type of yoga is uh, uh, recommended for different individuals. So Bikram yoga is not for everyone. So Pitta people, it's, it's the worst thing uh, if they do Bikram yoga because they, they are kind of like a combination and there is a fire dominance in the body. So if they do Bikram yoga, which is a hot yoga, it's going to aggravate their pitta to the sky. So similar way for vata, yes, it's good. Kapha, it's very, very good because then it, um, it creates a balance in your kapha and, and um, um, makes you feel lighter because it's like you are in a sauna with the hot water, you sweat profusely, and that actually makes you lose some weight and shed some kilos and, and even help you otherwise to be balanced. So um, it's very important to know your body type in Ayurveda, to be able to understand what type of yoga would be good for you, whether you should be doing uh, flow yoga or slow yoga, or uh, vinyasa or um, uh, ayengar, uh, which is like for the pitta people, very, very good. Uh, so even by looking at individuals, you can judge to some extent by looking, as I explained before, that all oh, this person uh, uh, who has a lean or skinny structure, um, that person is a vata type. Mm, but the exact understanding that comes from the pulse, uh, from the pulse analysis, that what type you are. So if you would have to visit an Ayurvedic practitioner, uh, you would have to go for the Nadi Pariksha first and, and uh, to be able to, uh, unless you are very experienced, um, like, a, uh, like myself, I've been practicing for more than 22 years like now. I can just, by looking at, I can even tell the combination, um, like what kind of like Prakriti and Vikruti it could be. So it all 
comes with a practice and and practice makes a man perfect we all understand so it's uh, uh it all depends like so now i can see people on the screen and i can tell like it's a pitta type or wapa type or kapha type so um or a combination whatever yeah so and even looking at your eating habits uh, so you can tell the traits uh, okay or oh, that person eats that kind of foods more which are fiery foods then yes like uh, you know people who like a lot of like hot and spicy foods and a lot of sweet texture like a lot of sweetness they are pitta and and kapha kapha is more like the earthy and and uh, like a um, more earthy people and uh, who like more carbs uh, and go for like potatoes and sweet potato and uh, cheeses and all the sweet textured and creams and all that kind of like stuff so uh, but vata people generally would like to go for warm foods and warm in temperature they don't like salads too much pitta people love salads like so all these kind of things that you ayurveda is such a vast science that more you dig into it more you learn and more you do so uh, you have all these different sort of like ways that you analyze you analyze the conditions and the body types and all that so with the tongue analysis also you can do like uh, look at the tip of the tongue and you can look at the middle of the tongue and the edge like the bottom part of the tongue which which makes it like um, this is again divided into what the pitta kapha zone so you've already got all the slides so you can always look at that like what what constitutes what and and um, uh, so uh, the scalps indicating poor assimilation uh, so you know the edges or if the tongue is like a little bit have a cuts or edges like at the tip uh, it means uh, like a, there is that's a kapha zone and that indicates like excess of fluid or kapha or a bad assimilation or poor assimilation um, and the cracks indicating the dryness um, in the tongue like middle of the tongue if you see like a cracks in the tongue that means that that indicates the dryness vata like the air sign so uh, at the bottom at the back of of the tongue in the throat area it's red raised papillae indicating high pitta so that's the vata zone and that's the dirty coating like if in the morning you get up and you have that thick layer of coating on your tongue it means your ama is um you have arm dosha um aggravated ama means like the indigestive food particles accumulated in the small intestines or the bacteria or the bad bacteria yeah so there is all these different sort of like we do urine analysis we do tongue analysis we do um uh, body analysis and examination and then nadi prediction and all that these are the means of uh, diagnosing or um, analyzing the body types or the conditions what conditions could be there in the in the uh, individuals so then we talk about the seven tissues the sapta dhatu sapta means seven and the dhatu means the tissues so in an individual we say five days at a time each tissue converts to the next so which is uh, ras rakta mans made asti majja shukra so we have like these tissues or the layers so we have seven layers so uh, plasma is the skin or the rasa um, rakta is the blood mansa is the muscle made is the fat asti is the bone majja is the bone marrow and shukra is the reproductive tissue so um, these are the seven tissues um, then with the anatomic uh, anatomically or uh, sharir rachna the formation of the body so ayurvedic anatomy it's based purely on observation and clinical experience it traces an intricate body 
that has connecting principles from the smallest atom to the interrelationship of the whole being. And the body is called Sharira, means that decays, that which decays. So ultimately, we say when there is a life, there is a death. So we say, uh, yes, the death is inevitable, but you can always create a balance when you are alive and you can prevent any kind of like conditions. So now when we do these body therapies, which are indicated before about marma therapy or uh, marmas are the vital points or the special junction points in the body. They are based on the shiatsu. Um, if when you do like all these body therapies, we puncha means five karma means action so the five actions to create a balance or eradicate the root cause of the problem so the massage is just not just a massage and we use all these like warm oils like uh, warm in temperature which are prepared all plant-based and prepared from all these ayurvedic herbs according to vata pitta and kapha again so we predict and analyze the body constitution and we look at the conditions like whether it's a vata disorder, pitta disorder or kapha and then we choose the oils accordingly when we do the massage. So it could be a combination of vata pitta oil, it could be a combination of pitta kapha oil or vata kapha oil. So uh, we use separate oils for the hair or the head massage because they they contain um, uh, or has uh, like all these nervine strengthening uh, herbs like uh, which strengthens your nervous system basically and uh, affects on your memory and sleep and relaxes your mind and strengthens your nervous system in the way that it's kind of acts as a passive meditation so we do a therapy called shirodhara which i forgot to put the picture on but it's like dripping the oil on the forehead for about half an hour after doing all this like a full body massage so we do this to relax and unwind the person but it it helps in releasing the happy hormones which is serotonin and dopamine and is very, very beneficial in conditions, mental illnesses. I have had great success in helping, assisting people with schizophrenia, bipolars, depression, anxieties, sleeping disorders, insomnia, migraines, all these issues. Like, But even that oil dripping, that also we do uh, tail dhara. Tail means oil. Dhara means dripping a constant flow of oil over this marma. So this is the third eye according to the chakra or the yoga. But then we drip the oil here and we do to and fro dripping of the oil on the forehead or the milk or the um, uh, takra dhara, which is the buttermilk, like a prepared uh, Pre the uh, uh, before the treatment, so uh, pre-treatment, we we prepare that uh, milk by cooking those uh, specific herbs or so the concoction uh, along with the milk or with the uh, buttermilk. So uh, for the kapha people, we generally like if they have um, um, sleeping disorders or anything, we do takra dhara. Uh, we do um, uh, kashir dhara with the people having uh, psoriasis, uh, eczema, dermatitis, any kind of like skin conditions where there is redness, heaty kind of like uh, areas, we use milk, which is milk is cooling. And then we prepare that milk with the decoction, concoction before hand, before we use it for shirudhara. But then we use even the oils that would be pitta pacifying which is going to calm your pitta, your fire element in the body. So the cooling oils. So that goes with marma therapy are the vital points 
we say you can make a dead alive and alive dead by doing these marma therapy. Marmas are very, very, uh, marma therapy is very, very uh, effective and, and very traditional way of doing uh, the massage. Um, and, and it's called a marma massage. But then we do the abhyangas, um, which is a self massage. Abhya means self massaging yourself. So you do that uh, at home by taking the oils at home. So, which you can recommend to the clients that you can buy this. Like, this is your body type, this is the oil that will suit you, and this is your condition. So, use this combination. So, that's how it works. Like, and the marma therapies, it varies the marmas, the points that can be variable with the height and weight of the person. So there is a, a, a different technique to measure those points, like all that you learn in the practical training, which I do uh, when I uh, do the courses, uh, like for uh, the, uh, these kind of like training for the massage and, and all that, like we teach you like uh, how to assess the points and where to look for that. But this is a very, it's a, it's a subtle energy network of Ayurveda through which uh, you get the results immediately. So with the same point, marmas are that important that you can make the dead alive and the alive dead by just pressing the same point. And there was a documentary I watched myself in um, Australia on SBS like uh, quite a few years back. They showed there was a chook like that came. The, the person actually pressed the point in the neck like here, um, which, is, uh, which is another marma, like a shipra marma, we call it. So all these like there is about 108 marmas um, in the body. So we, we name them differently and different body parts has different marmas so we do the points in the whole body along with the vigorous massage so uh it's for to to basically to get the um, best outcome or the result because it gushes the flow of blood and the circulation in the body so uh that was marma therapy and then we look at the digestive fire which is the agni, the gut health, is the most important principle of Ayurveda. So everything is based on the gut health. We say even your mental health or uh, is, is relative with your gut health. So if your gut is healthy, your brain is going to be healthy. And if your brain is healthy, it's vice versa. Your gut is going to be healthy. That's not important. But that that works more um, that if your gut is healthy your brain is going to be healthy so the gut to have a healthy gut it means your digestive fire like the fire that causes the digestion like your beer that's the agni agni is the fire so it's the metaphor of our own digestive system and all other metabolic functions that happens in the body that happens because of the digestive fire. So uh, it's very, very important to have a healthy gut, to have a healthy brain. So in Ayurveda, that's the main point that we address, uh, mainly to address the gut health. We first, the three pillars that I mentioned, Sleep, sex, and food, ahar, vihar, nidra. So these are the three factors we have to check when we check or do the analysis or diagnosis for the people. We always check these three things that what's the eating habits, the food, ahar, and what's the sleeping habits? What are the, because that all the sleeping habit uh, and, and uh, your sexual life and your eating habits, like that all relates to your gut health. So that's why we check all these things when we check how's your gut. Because if your sleeping patterns and everything is good and you are waking up in the Brahma Mahurta, which is 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. in the morning. So that's the perfect time. And it's called Brahma Mahurta, which is 
uh, you wake up before the sunrise and you um, if you're gonna wake up early you're gonna sleep early which means you're gonna have a healthy gut it just indicates like all these things are lifestyle adapting uh, things that we need to focus on they say if your if your elimination process is perfect in the morning uh, and you've passed proper bowels uh, you um, you had a good sound sleep you will feel fresh and you will feel balanced throughout your day so there wouldn't be any problems like if you're uh, diet is on time and everything is balanced. Otherwise, you accumulate ama, the toxins, the imbalance, or the indigestive food particles that accumulate in the small intestines. So that that actually happens because um, of the ama develops because if you're not sleeping and waking up on time, uh, especially with the people like who are night shift workers um, their their sleeping pattern is disturbed their eating pattern is disturbed because they are eating at odd hours uh, to be awake at night and that actually aggravates their vata which gives them the vata disorders like insomnias like indigestions which is ama toxins build up the body like indigestive food particles and then these people would have mental health issues too like depression because the brahma mahuta waking up in the morning activates your happy hormones which is serotonin and you wouldn't believe how it it works like even you can control that hormone secretion the happy hormone secretion with your lifestyle uh, changes and your adaption so what happens is when you wake up in the morning your serotonin starts um, releasing and that keeps you happy throughout the day and if you would wake up late it would naturally start activating the bad steroids or the bad hormones uh, that would create sadness depression anxieties and all that kind of like factors and it switches itself off like when you wake up early in the morning and you sleep early like good on time um, it would naturally activate and the serotonin shuts down and when you are awake at night the melatonin the then the bad uh, hormones start kicking in and that would create anxieties depressions and any kind of like and it's a natural process of the morning and evening and the sleep and the dark and the and the light so when your uh, face like you face the sun the light it just naturally you would feel that you feel happy when you come in contact with the sun so this is how like a all this work so it's it's uh, a deep study about the brain how the manas prakriti that works uh, so but then the seasonal behavior we have to follow the seasons to be able to assist with the diet so it's not one lifestyle or one how we say one size fits all so it's not one lifestyle or one diet that fits everybody it's very individualized and very patient-centric approach. So according to the season, in winters, you should always be, because it's cold outside, you need your body to be warm. And it's naturally that you feel that you need warmth when you are cold outside uh, in winters like so in summers you naturally crave for like cold stuff like because it's hot outside you are feeling the warmth and the hot then you want to drink like cold water and all that which is which is not good um either but because in ayurveda we say throughout the year you should be drinking always warm water at least if not warm then it should be like a body uh, temperature or just the tap water so um, especially
special season of daily regimes, dincharya, the day, how your day should spend. So daily healthy lifestyle habits is the swastha vritta. Uh, rising, brahma mahurta, between 3 and 7 a.m. Elimination, that should happen. So you should, your bowels should get activated and you would feel like passing the bowels each morning. That's the most important thing in Ayurveda. Do you pass the bowels every day? Do you eliminate? Because it's the most important factor that's a cause for any kind of like mental health because it means your gut is not healthy and you have a mental health issues. So the elimination, even to avoid any kind of like digestion issues, like that needs to be sorted with the elimination. So it's very important that you pass bowels every morning. That's the first thing. Then you look after the oral hygiene and how you look after the physical hygiene and the warm oil massage and abhyanga you do during the day then you do exercise or yoga and then uh, you have a bath like or a shower uh, and then you eat something healthier uh, that balances all the three doshas or the humans or the elements in the body and then before you sleep, you have the dinner, but you do meditate like uh, to um, put all your day activities to an end, to a calm. So um, the next one, um, elimination, as I said, how you can eliminate, how you can help your your clients or yourself uh, to eliminate so what you do is throughout the day it's recommended according to ayurveda particularly with the, with the times uh, that we are going through the crisis the global crisis of covid it's very important to have a good resistance and immunity because it all comes back to immunity and the resistance and all that is happening how you can build that uh, that actually Water is the best medicine, so but hot water because you will feel less thirsty. You wouldn't ever go dehydrated if you drink warm water because you'll pass less urine and you would retain that water in your body, which would actually help you to hydrate, keep yourself hydrated all the time and give a good looking skin and a beautiful skin. So the hot drinks, especially in winters, when it's cold, you definitely need more than the lukewarm. It should be a little bit closer to the hot, as hot as you can drink. So have like a, a start your day or begin your day or a dincharya from the morning, hot water or a lemon in a water with a honey, ginger tea, or whatever herbal teas, like you can, you should have something warm for starting your day. And then you, you brush your teeth. A lot of people brush their teeth, but they don't pay attention to their tongue, which I already showed like how we analyze and diagnose because the oral route is the main route for all kind of like conditions and issues because we, when we eat, like we eat through the mouth. And so everything, whatever we eat, that comes in the form of coating over our tongue. So it's very, very important to look after the tongue, which a lot of people ignore. A lot of people don't even brush their teeth every day, which is the disaster. Like and and apart from brushing the teeth, it's very important if you can do oil pulling, coconut oil pulling, um, like a, that's a special way of doing the oil pulling, like um, I've done sessions for that, like a, separately, but with the, with the tongue cleaner, it has to be a copper tongue cleaner, not the stainless steel or with a brush, you scrape your tongue. You need a copper tongue cleaner. And uh, that basically uh, why we say is because even when we um, drink the water in the morning, in the olden times, we used to say, uh, keep the water overnight in a copper mug. So the copper is basically antimicrobial. 
and it's anti-infective. Like so, when those copper contents get mixed with the water, it gives you, uh, it makes you eliminate um, in a proper manner and get rid of all the bad bacteria, uh, not the good one. But uh, with a tongue cleaning after brushing your teeth, it's most important to scrape your tongue with a tongue cleaner because you don't want that bacteria bacterial coating that's over your tongue to be going back into your stomach because when it goes back that what becomes armor or the indigestive food particles or the toxins and that creates all digestion issues so um so you begin your day with a hot water flush and then you do the oral hygiene and then the physical hygiene. How you do is every day we recommend people to instill Ayurvedic nasal drops into both the nostrils. That can be a ghee, coconut oil, sesame oil, uh, but it's not the one that we use for eating in the kitchen. It has to be a specific, there is an antalam, shadbindu talam, like the Ayurvedic um, specific oils for doing nasal cleanse, like because it's it's like a nasal cleanse. So you either do nethi, which you use like this, again, the copper nethi pot, or you do it with, the, uh, and you do it with a saline water, like with a lemon and pink salt. Uh, is highly recommended. No white sugar, white salt is advisable in Ayurveda, even to avoid conditions like high blood pressure, hypertension and all that. Uh, people with hypertension, they can, if they eat like uh, this pink Himalayan salt, their blood pressure won't go up. And then Nethi, that's the another way, yogic way of cleansing Nethi Karam with Himalayan salt water. And lemon so there is a specific way of doing it either you youtube it or like you learn it from some yogi or wherever you learn yoga so they can teach you how to do nathi um, to cleanse your uh, nasal pathway which actually affects even on your vision your brain your throat your respiratory any kind of like issues that get sorted by that and um, that's that's the must do thing like a, or you just put a warm oil into both the nostrils like a ghee two drops of ghee in each of the nostrils that's how it would help and then abhyanga just do abha abha means abhya means self uh, anga anga means your self organs so you massage yourself if you can't go um, to visit a doctor like an Ayurvedic doctor or you, for any reason like you can't afford it or you, there is no one there so you can always buy the oils and use it at home and then these are the specific like tables that we use for the massages that shown in the picture and the uh, one at the back is the steam sauna with your neck outside you sit inside like uh, there is a seat inside like and the front doors open and you sit inside so it's basically to create a balance in all the three doshas um, we say this is a pre-treatment or the prerequisite uh, that we do snehna and Svedna. Snehna means the love therapy. Sne means love therapy, means massage. So you massage and then you do the steam sauna, which is a prerequisite for any kind of like panchakarma therapy that we do. So the person that's next to it is doing a martial art, uh, Kalari art. It's called Kalari um, which is like a South Indian kind of like a martial arts that they do in Kerala and one of the massages is actually based on this martial art technique which is a sports massage and uh, we also teach that so there is a lot of different type of massages like the Marma massage there is a Bianga there is um, Snehna there is um, uh, Upton like a um, where we use dry powders to get rid of like um, uh, help people with the weight loss and stuff like that so there is all kind of like different techniques it's heaps of different variation in the massages in Ayurveda so if you want to learn you have to do those kind of like a, the short courses like we offer that we can talk about that later so um, then uh, this is like 
the healthy sabudana khichdi, which is a staple, I should say, the staple food or the staple diet for anybody to eat. It would suit any body type and any constitution. Um, it's it's like sabudana is kind of like a puffed uh, puffed rice, I believe. I'm not. Don't take me. Um, uh, yeah, take my word like for that. But I think like. But in Hindi, it's called sabudana. But you can Google it and see. Like I think it's puffed rice in more than something uh, language or something. Uh, and it's a particular grain that actually suits every single constitution. And uh, if you make a khichdi, which is a gruel kind of like a porridge kind of stuff, like you can make that either with that, or you can make rice and moong lentils, green moong lentils or yellow moong lentils. Like you can make a khichdi using the ghee and all the spices like uh, uh, spices are also the Ayurvedic herbs, like cinnamon to cloves and to uh, cumin seeds to turmeric. And uh, uh, turmeric has become like a fad now. So, anyways, but uh, it's been I've been recommending that to the people, like having digestion issues, any inflammations in the body. It's got millions of benefits. Any skin conditions, people having joint aches and pains, arthritis, and all that kind of stuff. Turmeric milk is a bliss. And, and using ghee, ghee is the most um, uh, recommended fat that people can take because it's a monounsaturated fat, which is easily digestible. And it's not as a bad fat, which you accumulate with the polyunsaturated fats uh, that you get it from the other, um, say, canola vegetable oils and all the I highly recommend either to use ghee, uh, even people with the cholesterol, if they don't use it raw on top of the curries and they just cook in that, it works as a bliss. You can eat all life and anything you cook, you can cook in the ghee or rice bran oil. Um, if you have like a cholesterol issues or anything like you can do the deep frying in the rice bran oil or raw vegetables like uh, you cook carrots uh, or beans and stuff like that that they also can be cooked in the ghee but you can use mustard oil as well so these are the healthiest oils and uh, they they are not fattening people uh, misinterpret like uh, about the ghee because especially with the cow's ghee it's the most likely digesting and these actually develop the good fats that you get from the ghee so it's a clarified butter or uh, because how you prepare is you basically take a full thickened cream and I prepare my own like at home and especially on the full moon night they say when you prepare that it gets even more kind of like the superpowers uh, that actually is even more beneficial for your stomach like and your gut like it's it's um, um, uh, like uh, the cow's ghee so is prepared from the cow's milk cream so you actually burn that whole cream. The fat actually gets burnt. So whatever comes out is the extract of the fat, like which is, that's why it's called monounsaturated fats. And they are good digestible fats for the body and for your intestines and stuff like that. So ghee is the best uh, for cooking uh, and um, add all the spices and uh, that, we we talk about the six tastes should be incorporated in the everyday meals like six tastes are there's a lot you can talk in ayurveda um i need a whole day like um uh, to actually just go on the tips like the basics but yeah so that's a different uh, topic like altogether when we talk about the diet like so that can be covered there but now i'll be just uh, I think like I should be fasting up. Um, just like a golden turmeric milk, as I advised, very good. Uh, not for everyone. Uh, people with a pitta constitution, sometimes uh, turmeric could be too warm for them. So um, uh, that also like, although uh, it's, it's like, a, you know, everyone is kind of taking it and people take turmeric even with the smoothies and cold stuff, but that's absolutely wrong. So in Ayurveda, 
turmeric only will benefit you if you uh, take it with a hot milk because milk is a kapha food which is heavy to digest and the turmeric it actually cuts out the fat out of it and then it makes it easily digestible and it goes only with the warm drinks so you can't have it with a coffee or a tea but people if they are allergic to milk say for example they can use soy milk they can use almond milk goat milk or they can use but the milk has to be boiled separately first and then you stir a pinch of turmeric into the milk and you can add a honey so the honey and um, this should never be warmed so honey should be used after the thing has been stuffed and turmeric should always be added after so it not only acts as anti-inflammatory but it builds up your resistance your immunity to fight or cope up with uh, the diseases and stuff like that and helps you with your pains and aches and skin conditions if people have acne psoriasis eczemas it cleanses and purifies your blood uh, so uh, turmeric is very good with the ghee uh, like a warm ghee if you add a bit of turmeric if someone gets injured if you give the milk at night before or even when the person gets injured you give them a milk with a pinch of turmeric only a pinch one pinch is enough in one cup like you don't need more to get the more benefit that that is another thing that people do so um they add a, a spoonful like but you need a spoonful you can use that in the cooking in the vegetables or meats or whatever curries or you you can use turmeric in a lot of cooking uh, but in in the milk it has to be um, only only a pinch in one fourth of the teaspoon in the warm milk um, in one cup so uh, it not only helps you in as an anti-inflammatory but even enhances your immunity uh, so builds your resistance so then you um, have that all that this is we were talking about the day routine how we went from morning to so you eliminate you do the oral hygiene and you do like you wake up early in the morning and then your day starts fresh and it will go smoothly and you would be end of the day you would feel like oh i need to go to bed like and before you go to bed you need to practice meditation yoga nidra which is dhyan dhyan means like getting into that uh a uh, subconscious state of mind is is meditation and and uh, you just bring your mind to the restful state and calm and just pay the gratitude to yourself and your body and to the day that the day was well spent and and offering that gratitude is the most important thing and reflecting on your day that what i achieved and i attained by doing all that during the day would bring you so much harmony in yourself within yourself and you will feel that wholeness and oneness and you'll feel relieved and calm and happier and in harmony uh, with your mind body and your soul would be happy and in spirits yeah so uh this is meditation could be any type you do transcendental meditation tm uh you do another one i practice tm myself like and um but you can do anything like a mindfulness or whatever you follow it doesn't matter end of the day what you do and and all it matters is that you are making an effort uh, and you are trying to live a healthier day and a healthier life health they say you can achieve the health from well-being the well-being can't be achieved from the health so uh, it's it's vice versa we have to build our health through the well-being which means existence in a conscious existence by following the day routine and lifestyle and eating habits namaste
I think that was what like um, um, was today like uh, that entailed like in Ayurveda um, like uh, and and I am open now for the questions thank you very much for listening patiently and I've been going on and on <laughs> so there is a lot I can talk but yeah um, I think we are doing some another time but uh, I'm open for questions, Carrie. Thank you. Uh, now back to you. Thank 